Good evening, Alex, Judeans, and everybody else. Are children being discriminated in our democracy? You're not allowed to vote in elections if you are four years old, eight years old, 12 years old, or 17 years old. Is this fair or is it discrimination? This is the main thing I'm going to talk about tonight. But I'm also going to talk about the nature of discrimination and related phenomena. I'm going to talk about what options we have. If we don't set the age for voting at 18, what other options do we have? This video is number four in a discussion between Alex, Judeans and myself. After my last video, where I argued that yes, we should have an universal age. It doesn't have to be 18. We could maybe take 17 or 16, but we should have universal age for voting. Joe James replied to me in the comment field and with the video. In his arguments, he directly accused me of being prejudiced, and the way I see it, he also indirectly accused me of being bigoted. I take this very seriously, but I do not take offense. I am convinced that he didn't do this to smear me. Instead, it was an honest analysis of my arguments. I do think he was off target, but the accusation needs to be considered. You see, here's a pro tip for everybody. All humans do have prejudice. And we don't know what our prejudices are. Therefore, if someone say that you are prejudiced, don't get defensive, don't say to yourself even that, no, I'm a good person, therefore the things I believe are correct. That's not how it works. You need to take a step back and think about the whole thing. See if the accusation is valid. If it is, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It means that you need to update your views a little bit. And we all do need to update our views sometimes. So far, I don't agree with Joe James. But he does have some compelling arguments, and most importantly, discrimination is not the same thing as treating people differently. It is treating people differently in a way that is not fair. And the burden of proof must always be on those who say that treating people differently and not giving them the same rights and responsibilities is a fair thing to do. There are cases where it is fair, but you need to support that fairness with heavy arguments. It is not okay to say that certain people should not be allowed to vote because they have not been allowed to vote in the past. That is not a valid argument at all. First of all, let us make a distinction between prejudice, bigotry and discrimination. I already mentioned what discrimination is, but prejudice, it is believing things that simply are not true. You have a preconception that is incorrect. And bigotry, that's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of attitude. It's about hatred and contempt and feeling superior. So we need to 
keep these three things apart. Prejudice, discrimination and bigotry keep up the distinction. And in the way I think, these three are three different facets of categorism. Categorism is when you do these kind of things to people, you base it on categorization of people. It is not inherently categorism to categorize people, but the categorization very easily devolves and disintegrates from being a tool for understanding to instead be a mental prison or a dirty weapon. There are many other facets as well, but there are also many different focuses. Categorism, it is this thing that we call racism when it's based on a categorization into different skin colors or races or ethnicities. And we call it sexism when it's based on gender. And we call it homophobia when it's based on the distinction between heterosexual and homosexual and directed at the later one. There are two other focuses of categorism that are extremely important in this particular debate. First of all, ageism. Ageism is bigotry, discrimination, prejudice and so on based on age, how old a person is. This is the basic thing we are talking about in this debate. The other one is ableism. It is prejudice, discrimination, bigotry and so on, either against people with disabilities or based on the categorization of ability. So this is what we are talking about tonight. I argue that in general children do not understand things as well as adults do. They don't have the mental capacity or education that adults do. And children are much more mentally and emotionally fragile than adults are. Now, this is a serious question. Is this prejudice? I would say that no. These beliefs are very strongly supported by facts. If we look to child psychology and neurology and so on, we have massive knowledge that support these claims and I am convinced that this is valid knowledge. It is not ideology. And I think that most of you who hear this can agree on this. I'm interested in your position too, James. I actually do think that you agree as well. You did point out that the same things have been said over the ages about women and people of color. And I agree. Women and people of color have time and again been compared to children and animals as a way of keeping women and pe people of color down and refusing their rights. And this is wrong. This is prejudice because it is not supported by the evidence. Women are not like children or animals. People of color are not like children and animals. The evidence does not support these racist, sexist claims. They are racist and sexist because they are not true. 
people are assigned things that is assumed to be true about them in spite of not being true it is assigned to them because of the gender or race they are categorized as this is totally unfair but now you could argue that different individuals develop at different pace, different speed and I agree with that uh, but it's not just one development children are growing up in so many ways at the same time and I think most children are ahead of the curve in at least one way but also behind the curve in other ways me as a teenager I was way above my age intellectually but not emotionally I usually socialized with people much older than me because people my own age were boring because their intellectual age were their intellectual age but I was still their age emotionally so this became a huge problem in many ways but anyway we do develop in many ways it's very complicated I do not believe that everybody above a certain age is a certain way and everybody low, below a certain age is a certain way so I have a nuanced understanding and this is not about prejudice my argument for having a certain age for voting is that it's better than the alternatives I do think that it sucks to have a universal age for voting I am simply saying that the alternatives suck even more and we need to compromise in a previous discussion you proclaimed yourself to be an idealist and to some extent I am an idealist as well I don't want to make I mean if we are going to make a choice between the needs of the individuals on one hand and whatever society feels ready to accept on the other hand then I am totally on the side of the individuals just, just like you proclaimed yourself to be but it's not just about what society feels ready to accept the needs of the individuals has to be weighted against the needs of the individuals not only do different individuals have different needs but people are complex one person may have a need that is contradicted by another need held by the same person so we need to compromise not with bigotry but with the complexities of the world I am an idealist in the way that I care about everybody's right but I'm not an idealist in the utopian sense I don't think we can reach a perfect society we just need to make society as good as possible I feel from your argument you James that you are envisioning a zero tolerance policy on discrimination that discrimination is wrong period we should not have any discrimination and that is a nice thought but I think it's more reasonable to say that discrimination sucks therefore we need to have as little as possible of it but we need to weigh different needs against each other 
and a bit of discrimination is acceptable as a compromise when no better alternatives are available. I do agree that it sucks for some 16 years olds and maybe a few individuals who are younger than that. And by the way, my argument is not that the age of voting should remain 18. My argument is that we should have an age for voting at all. Lowering the age of voting to 16. Well, I am in favor of change, changing local elections so 16 years old can participate in them. And let's see how that goes. If it works out well, it could be a good idea to lower the limit for everybody. I mean, for the real elections too. Of course, you live in England and I live in Sweden. These are stable democracies with an aging population. Unstable countries with a very young population. It might be more problematic there. Those things I talked about in my previous video, they are not about children, they are about society at large. They are about how politicians, lobbyists and so on act. And letting people younger than 18 vote in these countries may be much more problematic in practice than having it in Sweden or England. Just wanted to point out that. But what options do we have? What I can see from the debate so far is three options. First of all, we have a universal age for voting. Second, we have some kind of test to see who is capable of voting and who is not. And thirdly, we let people vote for those who can't vote for themselves. Um, that thing I said in the previous video about babies voting, this is about this third alternative. Uh, if parents could vote for their babies, and some Christians could start arguing that fetuses are people too, so unborn children should also be given a vote handled by the parents. I am in favor of a universal age for voting because both alternatives are worse. And so far, no other alternatives have been presented. Alex and you, James, both of you have tried to argue that it is possible to not have any limit at all. But so far, I, I think this discussion has shown that no, this option doesn't exist. Um, I would like to start with highlighting Joe James' best option. Um, this is of the second type, having a test for who can vote and who can't. But the idea here is to not make it a complicated civic test. My argument in the previous video was that having a civic test that can easily be manipulated by the government or some other faction to make sure that their voters will get to vote younger than the opposition. And there would be accusation of this. But what Joe James suggests is that no, we shouldn't have a test per se. Instead, we should let the children do it on their own. If they manage to vote without help from anybody, then they get to vote. And if they screw up and vote for Donald Duck, that's not a problem because that vote wouldn't count anyway. This is a very compelling argument. I'm going to return to it in a bit, but first I'm going to bring up 
GeoGames other suggestion that he presented in his video. This was that we disallow the parents to help, but instead we put it on the teachers. And GeoGames, you argue along those lines, and at the end you conclude that yes, the teachers would be able to push, indoctrinate, coerce, etc. the children. And I agree with that, and I think your conclusion, or at least the conclusion of your argument, is that no, um, this proposition, it wouldn't mean that there isn't a limit. It simply means that we have moved from type 2 to type 3. Instead of having a test, it's a matter of the school being able to vote in the name of the children. And this is even worse than letting the parents do it. I mean, if we have one patriarchal head of household who is given 10 votes because he forbid his wife to use contraception so she have many babies that he can vote for, that's not fair, that's not nice. But if we have, a, for example, a very conservative old-fashioned principal who is given several thousand votes, let's say that this guy have 2,500 votes because that is the number of students in his boarding school and they are all encouraged through the teachers to vote for whatever the principal wants and what the principal wants the principal gets. The teachers are allowed to help the children to... This doesn't even have to be coercion. I mean, parents and teachers teach the children what is right, and the children believe it. So they won't even have to force the children in any way. Uh, in most cases, if we're talking about a little bit older children. So regardless of whether you make it a civil test or let the teachers help directly and therefore in practice put the power in their hands. In both cases we would get politicized schools. Schools would be under pressure from society to make sure that the children vote for the right thing. This would not be good for the children. And there's another problem as well with both options. Let's disregard Donald Duck. You are entirely correct, you James, that voting for Donald Duck doesn't hurt. It is simply meaningless. And I didn't bring it up as a scenario for how it could go wrong. I brought it up using myself as an example of how unfit the typical child is for voting, for forming their own qualified opinions about what should be voted for. So let's disregard that scenario. But there's another one. Because there was a somewhat compelling argument that was made, I don't remember if it was you, you James, or somebody else, maybe it was several of you, but you talked about teens who had good ideas, in this case, for example, understanding that George Bush would be a bad president, and they were allowed to com campaign against him, but they were not allowed to vote, and this was unfair to them, and I agree with that. Again, Voting age is a matter of compromise, not a matter of being fair to everybody. But, you see, there's a flip side of that coin. Take now instead the teenager who thought that George Bush was cool, and only later realized that, uh-oh, 
this guy was totally psycho and the things he did to the world. It's one thing to have thought that he was cool, it's another to have voted for him. There are already too many teenagers feeling way too much guilt for the way the world is. Voting is a responsibility more than it is a right. I don't think it would be fair to put this responsibility on children. Well, maybe 16 years old, but 12 year olds? Are we supposed to let them bear this burden that not only society fucked up, but it's your fault, little one. You voted for the bad guy, it's your fault that they behave the way they do. That is... Most children are not ready for that kind of pressure. I think it's cruel to the children to put that on them. But there's also one more problem with the civic test version. Let's say that we do it like Judy suggested. Don't help them, let them try on their own and if they fail to vote they are not ready to vote. Um, this becomes a problem with ableism. There are a lot of adults who need help with voting. Are we going to disallow them the right to vote? Of course not. That's not what Hugh James argues. He doesn't bring disabled adults into the analysis at all, but he should. Because the rules need to be the same for everybody. And letting people help you to vote, that's not much of a problem with disabled adults. But it is a problem with children. Of course we could do some little discrimination that okay, children are not allowed any help, but adults are. But it becomes a very complicated case by case and lots of things for people to get upset over. We need simple rules. In the end, I think it gets fairer that way. So, these are my arguments for now and I'm looking forward to a continued debate. Live long and prosper.